Well, we're very glad that the folks at home are able to join us online. So welcome to Christchurch Horizons YouTube channel for those who have just arrived. And to those who are joining us on WhatsApp, we're very glad you're able to share in this service that ma- in that way. Well, we've just been singing uh, in worship of the Lord. don't know about you, but I could have sung all three hymns all over again. <clears throat> it was uh, very beautiful to listen to you this morning and to hear God being worshipped that way. Listen to Psalm 67 as the Lord calls us into his presence and as we hear of God's blessing upon us as well. It's a kind of a benediction. Psalm 67, but it is also uh, a missionary prayer, as it were. In the light of our theme, uh, this is a fitting way to commence this service. May God be gracious to us and bless us, and make his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the people praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God, shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. Well, please join with me as we come before God in a prayer of adoration this morning. All praise and glory and honor be to you forever, O Lord God Almighty. Truly you are worthy to be praised. Great is your name and greatly to be praised. We thank you, O Lord, that you have brought us in. You have, like that wild olive, grafted us into the domestic olive. You have bound us to Israel. You have made us the recipients of the covenants of promise. We who were once a people far from God, a people lost, but now found a people without God and without hope in this world, and you have saved us. All praise be to you, for you have done this. You have sent your Son, your only begotten Son, to die for us, that we might live, that we may receive eternal life. Thank you, Lord, that we have this expectation of this blessing, that you shall bless us. And we are left speechless at the thought. Thank you, O Lord, for blessing us so richly. Thank you that we may gather as a royal people, a royal priesthood, a holy people. Thank you for blessing us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Thank you that we are seated there with our Savior. Thank you, O Lord, for showing us that this blessing has come, not because of anything we have done, but because of your great mercy. You have chosen us according to your purposes in predestination. You, for your name's sake and to the praise of your grace and glory, have done all this. O Lord, you have shed your blood that we may be adopted as sons, that we may be the recipients of that blessing that came to Abraham. You have poured out your Spirit upon us as the first fruits, the guarantee of our salvation. Lord, we pray, even as this benediction reads, please be gracious to us now. Please bless us and cause your face to shine upon us. Even as we come to your word, make your word way known to us. Your saving power, may it be revealed to us. May our hearts and our minds be changed even today to this end that we may be part of that great host that praise your name. And if there be 
one person in our midst or listening to this broadcast that doesn't know you, that doesn't know the grace of God, that has never experienced the power, the saving power of the Lord Almighty, please save them. Please awaken them. Please see the greatness of your love, the depth of your compassion. Please show them your heart, Lord, even today. So bless us, we pray, with your presence. Grant us to worship in spirit and in truth. Please, Father, grant us to be that people that you seek, who worship you. We ask for this blessing in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. We're going to come uh, to a prayer of confession and to prepare our hearts for that. I'm just going to read from Matthew chapter 5 a description of the disciples of the Lord Jesus, a description of those who will live in the kingdom of God. And as I read them, reflect upon your own character and ask whether you are described here and if you are not seek the Lord in repentance the Lord Jesus he said these words on the Sermon on the Mount he opened his mouth and taught them saying blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, just so far. Well, take a minute now and reflect on whether you've been a faithful disciple of the Lord Jesus. And then let us pray together. Let us pray. Lord, we come before you and we know that you see our hearts. You search our hearts. You know our deeds. You've seen when we've not been poor in spirit, but proud in spirit. You've seen us when we ought to have been mourning for our sins and the sins of those around us and have not but have been hardened. You've seen our lack of desire for righteousness. You've seen how cruel we can be and how careless we are about your kingdom and those outside your kingdom. We've not been merciful. Our hearts have not been pure. We've not sought to make peace when we should have. And we've not been that different from the world so that it has persecuted us. Please forgive us. Oh Lord, look upon us and forgive. Please let nothing come between us. Please cleanse us from our sins. From our lusts. From our folly. And from deeds that have dishonored you. From words that have offended you. And please change us and make us into those for whom you died. Grant us to be those who know this happiness, this blessedness. Those who reflect your very heart in all their lives. Those who walk as the Lord Jesus walked. So please be gracious to us, Lord, and cleanse us, we pray. Thank you for your promises in the gospel of forgiveness to those who seek you in repentance. Thank you that we may always seek you in repentance. So 
But Lord, as we worship you this morning, let nothing hinder a rich communion with you. Let nothing hinder the word of God coming to us. We ask for this blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to read this morning from the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 61, we'll read from verse 10 to the end of chapter 62. Isaiah 61. Isaiah is speaking of a time of the Lord's favor and salvation, and we read of his worshiping God at the end of that. So Isaiah 61 verse 10, hear the word of God. Isaiah writes, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not be quiet until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken and your land shall no more be termed desolate. For you shall be called my delight is in her and your land married. For the Lord delights in you and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as a, the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. On your walls, O Jerusalem, I've set watchmen. All day and all night they shall never be silent. You who put the Lord in remembrance, take no rest and give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes it a praise in the earth. There's an injunction for us to pray. Give God no rest until he establishes his people. Verse 8. The Lord has sworn by his right hand and by his mighty arm, I will not again give your grain to be food for your enemies. And foreigners shall not drink your wine for which you have labored. For those who garner it shall uh, eat it and praise the Lord. And those who gather it shall drink it in the courts of my sanctuary. Go through. Go through the gates. Prepare the way for the people. Build up, build up the highway. Clear it of stones. Lift up a signal over the peoples. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. And they shall be called the holy people the redeemed of the Lord, and you shall be called. Sought out a city not forsaken. Well, meditation just on that passage could give you hours of prayer if you saw the full meaning of it. Let's come now to God to bring our petitions to the Lord before we hear the word of God. Lord, you taught us to pray your kingdom come when we thank you that we live in the expectation that your kingdom will be raised up, that you will not fail 
in your purpose to establish a people for yourself. Lord, we thank you that you have made us part of that kingdom. We're no longer aliens and strangers. We're no longer the enemies of God. But we've been reconciled through our Savior, our Lord Jesus. We thank you that we no longer oppose you and your people. We thank you, Lord, that we now are part of that Jerusalem. We are part of a people who will give you now no rest until we see it established and your praises lifted up from this earth. We thank you for the privilege we have of laboring in your kingdom and holding forth your word to those outside the kingdom as stars shining in a dark sky. We hold out to your light, your truth to a perishing generation. Please help us to do that, Lord. Especially here in Horizon where you've placed us. Please grant us to be faithful in our witness of the gospel to our neighbors and our families and our, the suburbs around us. Forgive us that we are not faithful in this matter and grant us sincere repentance. Keep us from ever being ashamed of the gospel. Lord, we pray, give us the joy you have in seeing a sinner converted. We know you rejoice when one repents. We know that the whole host of heaven rejoices when a sinner repents. We know you rejoiced over our repentance. We know you are glad as we entered your courts. Lord, we thank you for this. And we pray you will give us the same heart. So please, Lord, be merciful as we labor for you in this place. Grant us lives and words that glorify your name. Keep us from living inconsistently with our message. Grant us to be a holy people, we pray. Grant us to live up to that name, the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, a people sought out, a city not forsaken. Lord, we pray for those in our midst who have been suffering. We pray for our brother Willie, who's just uh, recently diagnosed uh, with the coronavirus. We ask that you'll keep him safe, we'll keep his daughter Haley safe, and bring our brother back to us that he may worship with us. We thank you that he's not suffering greatly at the moment, but we pray that you will, uh, you will uphold him. Please watch over Nazipa, we pray, as she suffers the, and continues to battle with headaches and trouble since the accident. We don't know the cause, Lord, you, we know that you know. We pray for the deliverance of our sister, your daughter. We pray this especially so that her and Elias may serve you in their kingdom. We thank you for their zeal and love of you, and we pray they will be able to continue serving you. Watch over our sister Monica, we pray. Please raise her up. Thank you for her delight in you these many years. Please, Lord, uh, grant her her heart's desire uh, to recover and serve you. We bring Anthea and Dawn. We pray, Lord, that you'd help them in, in their own weaknesses. Think of Nolene and family. We pray, Lord, that you would hear their prayers. Enable them to be strengthened every day in body and soul. Think of our sister Natemba and Bali and Tando. We pray, please, Lord, watch over them, comfort them, be present with them. Think of Mr. McKenzie as well, who has grieved as well. Pray that you would uphold him in his grief and in his loneliness these days. May you know wonderful times of communion with you, Lord. Once again, Lord, we want to just pray for our brother Jonathan Holt as he battles uh, continually uh, for probably the rest of his days, it would seem, uh, this cancer. Keep it under control. We thank you for the health you've given him. 
We thank you for the extended time you've given him. Please grant his blessing on his labors at Bethany Baptist. Please be, uh, bless that congregation and bless the elders that labor alongside him. We thank you for them. We thank you for a faithful ministry that has affected, affected so many lives. Thank you for the other ministries. Thank you for uh, the preacher's uh, seminary. And we uh, pray that that would be blessed and that it would be able to continue despite the hindrances. So please bless the African Preacher's Seminary that uh, they've started. Bless those who teach and those who receive your word. So please strengthen your servants there, we pray. Lord, we pray for all of those in our own land who are involved in evangelizing and trying to reach the, the lost. We pray for the many missionaries who've even come from other countries who labor. We thank you for them. We pray, Lord, that you will bless them, enable them to walk in the truth, and enable them to be uh, bright lights for your name's sake. So we lay them before you. We thank you, Lord. We ask that even as your word is read or preached throughout the land today, that you would be present in grace and in power and to save men and women and children. Lord, our land is in great need. Many will die in rebellion and sin today even. And especially as this virus continues to rise and spread, more will be dying. Lord, we pray, have mercy in the midst of judgment and save many for yourself. Lord Jesus, we remember that you told Zacchaeus, you've come to seek and save the lost. Oh Lord, would you not come and have mercy on our land. To this end, we pray for the state president and the cabinet who rule, that you would save them from their own rebellion and sin. So that before they even seek to do what is right, they will be given grace and power to do what is right. And we pray that their at least expressed intentions would be met to curb the rotten corruption that has crept into our government. So we ask, preserve our government, we pray. We ask this to the end that you would enable your people to serve you without hindrance and in the quietness of their lives. Lord, we pray this to the end that all men may be saved from every rank and position of our country. We ask that this trial, this that has come upon us in your providence would be a means of many seeking your face and not a hardening in our land. Please help our doctors, protect those who are your children, we pray especially. We ask that you would protect everybody though, uh, who work in the front lines. Please bless their labors. Now we ask for ourselves Please, Lord, open your word to us. As we consider your word, Lord Jesus, we pray that you would speak to us this morning. We pray that we would leave this place, not as we entered, but having learnt something more, seen something more, left our sins and grown in grace. So please change us, conform us to yourself, Grant us to have your very heart within our own breasts. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. We're going to read the whole chapter, but we'll only be looking at the first ten verses. And we'll come back to the third parable next Sunday.
Luke chapter 15, verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so. I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Verse 11, and he said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me, and he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the field to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods and the pigs that the pigs ate. And no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he's found. And they began to celebrate. Now, his oldest son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go, and his father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It is fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Just so far. 
This morning we're going to simply look at this subject of the first two parables of this parable. Under the heading, Rejoice With Me. Because I think that's God's admonition to us. That's God's encouragement to you today. In the words of the parable, God wants you to rejoice with Him. God would have you see His heart for the converted sinner, the one who has come to repentance. And he would have you uh, express the same joy. He would have you experience the same joy. As you know, these parables are among the most well-known parables in the Bible. Uh, Children around the world want these parables stories told to them. And I'm sure you at Sunday school heard Luke 15 uh, taught on more than one occasion. Two of the parables are unique to the gospel. Uh, the, the second two. The lost coin and the prodigal son. And uh, the first one, we have one other occurrence of it and that's in Matthew 18. And all three parables teach one lesson. But they have different nuances. And, and it is this. The joy that God has in the conversion of the rebellious, the wicked, the sinner. The first two parables really have to emphasize four things. Something lost, something found, And joy. Sorry, something lost, something searched for, something found, and great joy. And the first two obviously illustrate the sinner who's lost, who's searched out, who's found, and the joy uh, of that. The third parable really emphasizes the reception that God gives. Those who are changed and saved. And, uh, and not so much those, the first few emphasis, but it's all included in the same theme. There is a, an escalation in the picture. The first two are just illustrative. The third one is almost a it's a, a parable and a story and we'll see that it definitely is a parable but it's it's put into a historical setting so that you can see the depth of the compassion and the joy that our heavenly father has they wonderfully displayed in detail and we'll look at that next week so there's going to be an overlap in themes of course over the next two weeks but uh, over these two weeks but Hopefully you'll see something new next week. Today we're just going to look at the first two parables. The two illustrations of God searching and seeking the lost and the joy that he has when he finds a sinner converted. So we're simply going to look at God's joy at the conversion of the sinner. And then we're going to look uh, at the the joy of God's people at the conversion of a sinner. And then we will look at what detracts from that joy. Just today. Because that's the whole point of the passage. The, the The Pharisees see the Lord Jesus, the Pharisees and the scribes, in fact, Teachers of the law. They see the Lord Jesus taking a seat. With the tax collectors and sinners. Now we read that so often. That it can wash by us very easily. And that's because we don't really realize. How the Jewish people regarded tax collectors. And those who gathered around them. Tax collectors were really legal gangsters. They were Jewish people who tended for the right to collect taxes for the Roman government. 
so they were treacherous. But more than that, unlike all the Jewish people, they openly sinned. They didn't hide their sins. And they would gather with the likes of that. They were the, the, the defiant, brash gangsters. They were the thieves. They would pull you into an alleyway and put a knife under your chin at the drop of a hat. They mixed with prostitutes. They would probably even be involved in running prostitution. They uh, would have connections in the dark underworld. And the government recognized their rights to collect taxes. This is the difference. So you can imagine how hated they were. Synagogues of the time would not even receive a gift, no matter how great it was, from a tax collector. Now, they see the Lord Jesus sitting down with the likes of these people. Uh, prostitutes and tax collectors. The guys who had harmed them. The folk who sin openly, unlike the Pharisees. They don't hide anything. They would swear in your presence just to see your reaction. They would find the vilest language you could... And I, I'm trying to illustrate who these people are. I, I don't have a record in the Bible of them swearing. Okay? Uh, but uh, you, you, get, you, get, you got the picture? Uh, these are rotten folks. And they just don't understand it. A, a Pharisee wouldn't dream of sitting down to a meal with one of these folk. It could be something like, uh, and I think there is a place, I'm not going to tell you where it is, but there is a place, and uh, not even that far from here, a hotel that is notorious, run by uh, gangsters. I'm not going to tell you the nationality. And, um, and there's prostitution there. Now, can you imagine you saw one of the leaders of the congregation just walking through the doors of the bar of that hotel? And in fact, uh, you saw a, a modestly dressed lady walking right next to her, and you saw him walk up and order a beer. You would say, what on earth is going on here? You would, you would report that person. Uh, if it was me, I'm sure you'd run to Jill. Do you know where your husband is right now? He's at that hotel. You know the people where they fence stolen goods from folk who are held up? That same place. You know the place where they, they engage in prostitution and trade drugs? You know that place where people get murdered? He, he, What's Michael doing there? Uh, what's Neil doing there? That's the picture going on here. They saw him actually not just sit down and talk, <laughs> but talking in a friendly manner. He receives them. There's no barrier. He's not holding them back. And they can't believe it. And they are also accusing Jesus of immorality here. Look at the when they, they, they're now bringing a shed in, uh, to his character. You think, he must be like them. Forgetting everything that the Lord Jesus had just taught them. In fact, the Lord exposed their, the Pharisees' wickedness in showing how high the standard was. He had taught them, unless your righteousness surpasses theirs, you have no place in the kingdom of God. He would teach them what the, how God viewed immorality. You just lust after someone in your heart. You committed it adultery. And just now, suddenly forget all of this. His purity, his caution in his language. But this same one is sitting with people who are very glad he has come to sit with them. And many of them will be saved after this. And we have record of that. And we'll look at, Lord willing, one record. That's what's going on here. And so the Lord sees this and he teaches them three parables to show them God's attitude to the sinner. God doesn't hate sin any less than he did in Matthew chapter 5. God's judgment on the sinner has not gone away. But he wants to show them God's joy. When a sinner is saved. When what is lost is found. I want to show you God's intention to save and, and redeem. You see, these Pharisees, they just 
delighted and rejoiced in their ability to obey the, the law of God. And they based it on the rules, their religious rules. They didn't delight in God and didn't delight in the things God actually delighted in. That's what this passage is also about. And in fact, that is because they themselves are in a worse condition than those Pharisees, those tax collectors, ironically enough. They need redeeming. They should be delighting in God's redemption. They should be delighting in how Jesus saves sinners. But they're not. This is one of the great themes of the book of Luke. And he gives them a simple lesson. A shepherd has got a hundred sheep. Now if he lost one, he might actually not even notice that much. But because he knows his sheep and because he cares for his sheep, he leaves the 99 there in the field and he goes after that one. And he searches intently. And when he finds it, he runs after it, grabs it, and he lifts it because probably it's walked up into the mountain somewhere and now he's got to make sure it gets back and he doesn't entrust it just to walk on its own. He puts it over his shoulders, grabs its legs, and he walks back. And that was a common sight in those days. And the sheep's stomach would rest against the back of his neck. One of the oldest Christian statues that exist comes out of the catacombs of Rome. It's in a museum in, in, in Rome. And uh, it's, I believe, about three feet high. I went and looked it up and searched for it. And it was carved by a Christian. And to show you how precious this doctrine was to them, even while they're suffering for the faith, they remembered that they are a people redeemed by Jesus. And the, the shepherd has a sweet or serene look on his face. He's happy to be doing this. As he's found his sheep and he's walking back. And so this is a picture that was precious to the believers in about the year 280 to 290, somewhere there, BC, uh, AD. Copy BC. AD. Is it precious to you? It's only precious to you if you know that you're the sheep put on the shepherd's shoulders, had your feet grabbed and are brought back safely, having been lost in the mountains. Without God, without hope to change the picture, aimless, left to your own, you will perish and die. Lost, and then found, having been searched for, followed by joy. Sometimes we have this view of God, that he's just an infinite ocean of passivity of some sort but he's not he he reveals his heart in that very picture and Matthew gives us the alternative uh, version of this so if he finds it truly I say to you he rejoices over it says Matthew more than over the 99 that never went astray. Verse 14, So it is with the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. God doesn't want the death of a sinner. The lost coin is also a vivid picture for them. It's a picture of a poor woman who lives in a typical house of those days that had a dirt floor or compacted floor, which would have been dusty and probably had hay laid over the top of it. Those houses had no windows. Uh, we're talking about the poor of the poor. She has ten coins. Now, for her to lose one of these coins, uh, uh, which would meant a day's wage, you can imagine how great that loss would be. So unlike the 99 losing the, you know, the the shepherd who owned 900 sheep, she can't afford to lose this coin. 
And so she notices a coin has has gone missing. A day's wage is missing. And she sweeps the floor. She clears the hay. She turns the lamp on to get as much light into that dark little house. And, And she's frantic. And she looks and then she suddenly finds it in the corner. It's probably covered over by the dust and the hay. And she calls all her friends. It says, you've got to rejoice with me. I'd lost a days of wages. And I found them. I know a little bit of this rejoicing. You know Jillian, she loves cats. And you also know a happy wife is a happy life. <clears throat> well, we have a cat named Nuts. When we lived in Randburg, we loved to wander. The cat drove me crazy. I used to go missing. Anyway, one day the cat was missing and time was too long. I think it was, we know, it's by the second day the cat's not home. I can't remember the time. You have to ask Gillian about that. And, and I knew, I spoke to my mother who knows a little bit about cats and she said, often a cat gets a fright, will run down a drain. And I, I was really worried about this cat. And uh, off I went, searching the suburb, and I looked for the drains, calling down every drain I found, and I just started to walk in greater circles away from the house, and I just kept and going and going. And the longer the time went, the more the intensity of my concern, until I was burdened. And then I looked up, I thought, if if, if it begins to rain and the cat's in the drainage system, that's the end of the cat, miserable wife, you know how it goes, and so I got worried, I walked into an old age home, a village, an old age village, and a retirement village, and I, just to see if my cat had wandered in, persuaded the security there to allow me in, and next thing I thought I heard a a mouth of a cat. Sure, my heart started to beat. And I listened intently. And I heard it again. So it wasn't my imagination. And then followed the noise until I heard it down a drain. And in fact, we lifted a huge, heavy drain and I went down into the drainage. Couldn't coax. I heard the cat clearly down there. It was now quite away from home. I finally... The most expensive phone call I ever made, I gave 50 rand to a man to give me his phone. And I uh, phoned Joel and said, you must come now. And we coaxed the cat out. Now what's the point of that? Joel's love for the cat was very evident and we were really happy. Could have had a party that night. Uh, I think Nuts was the happiest out of it all. So very hungry and very thirsty. Very lost in an underground tunnel system. So it wasn't a sheep. God wants these pictures to teach you something. You know the joy. If you've ever lost an animal, you would know what that sheep is. God uses simple pictures so you see the depth of his heart in the matter. God rebuked the false shepherds and prophets in Ezekiel's time, because they didn't care for people. They didn't care for the lost in Israel. And he, they were like these Pharisees. They didn't care for those who are without God and without hope. And so the Lord tells them, he sends the prophet Ezekiel to them. In Ezekiel 34, he said this, The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, as the shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed their sheep? I think many a pastor in South Africa is going to have the same rebuke. Unfortunately, those who fleece God's people for their own money. So he's against them. And he then later tells them why they've they use the sheep uh, for themselves. 
And uh, he says later on, the weak you've not strengthened, the sick you've not healed, the injured you've not bound up, the strayed you've not brought back, the lost you've not sought with force. So, sorry, the, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. And then later again, verse 10 of that passage, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I'm against the shepherds, and I will require my sheep at their hand, and put a stop to their feeding of the sheep. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths, and they will not be food for them. So how will God do this? How will God rescue these broken, torn up sheep? Well, he tells you in verse 23 later in the chapter. I will set over them one shepherd. And my servant David, my servant David, and he shall feed them. And he shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David will be prince among them. I am the Lord I have spoken. Now, the Lord is telling them that he's, he himself is going to shepherd the sheep, and then he says he's going to send David. Well, those two things come together. David has been dead for 500 years when these words have been written. So what does he mean? He, he means David's greatest son. He means the one who's the son of David, but also the son of God. And here you see God himself shepherding and rescuing his sheep, but the same one who is the son of David. David, this is the one whom David prefigured. This is the one that David was a shadow of. And that's, that's you and I. And so when you open the book of Luke, you have the Lord Jesus displaying that very fact. He is the one coming to find the lost sheep of Israel. And and then in chapter 19, you have another passage that's unique to the Gospel of Luke. And that's the saving of Zacchaeus. It's such a beautiful story. Another story that children know very well. You know the story of Zacchaeus. Too short, climbs a tree, has to see and listen to Jesus, the sycamore tree. Next thing we're going to all be singing the choruses about that. Um, and, and it looks as if Zacchaeus is the one seeking Jesus. But then you find out that it's actually Jesus who's come to seek Zacchaeus. Listen to the words. Jesus sees him up there. So when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. There they go again, those Pharisees. He has gone into the guest to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. Now listen to verse 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. It looks as if Zacchaeus was looking for the Lord, Jesus. Jesus says, actually, it was me who was looking for you, and I found you. You see, the fact that he started searching for the Lord meant God's grace had commenced in his heart already. That is the ministry of the Lord Jesus. You see, if you're not saved this morning, the Bible says you're lost. You're lost. In fact, in verse 10, verse 7, verse 10, verse 23, verse 32, the theme is just repeated again and again. The fact that sinners are lost and are found and the fact that God rejoices over them. There's actually joy in heaven. Verse 7. Of the one sinner who repents. Verse 10. There's joy before the angels of God. Not only those previously said, but angels. Uh, and the point is, 
they're rejoicing with God. Why? Because God has saved someone. And angels, they love to look into these things. The scripture tells us that. They search these things out. They're always inquisitive about it. They always want to know. It's always a reason to pr- worship God and rejoice. In fact, the book of Hebrews describes that heavenly gathering as a festive gathering. The Bible tells us we only love God because he first loved us. The scriptures tell us that it's while we were yet sinners, not seeking the Lord, that Jesus died for us. This is the greatness of his love. He doesn't love because we loved. He loves first and then we respond in love. He finds us the way that shepherd goes into the hills, searching behind rocks and trees until he finds us. And when he finds us, he rejoices. He has that look on his face as he picks up that Sheep, that relief that he's got. The sheep's not going to die, it's going to live. You saw me rush during one of the hymns, pick up my Bible, because I just remembered I forgot to mark this passage. When it comes to Zephaniah, I never leave it to myself just to find the passage because I can never find Zephaniah. If any of you can find Zephaniah in two seconds, you're very good. <clears throat> Zephaniah. I, I was going to use this as an Old Testament reading, but we've read it so often in this church that I decided, no, we can't read it again. But I am going to read it as a reference to you. The one beautiful thing of Zephaniah 3 is the one place in the Bible that tells you that God himself sings. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival so that you will no longer suffer reproach. When God saves you, he sings with everybody else in heaven. That's the Lord we serve and worship. We read Isaiah 62 so that you can see when a sinner is saved, God rejoices over his people saved who have come to repentance as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride. Love floods the bridegroom's heart and he rejoices. That's why there's a marriage banquet. God is glad to save you. Sometimes we think of God in other terms. Before I go on to the people's joy, I just want you to notice one thing. That what happens when God saves you? The kind of person. It's the soul that repents. It's the one whose heart has changed. It's the one that Ezekiel says has the hard heart removed and a heart of flesh replaced. Verse 7, over one sinner who repents. And verse 10, just so I tell you there's joy before the angels of God, over one sinner who repents. How do you know someone's been converted? Well, convert means to change. And the change is characterized by two things. Faith in the Lord, trusting in the Lord, and repentance. That's what makes up conversion. Here's the characteristic. And here's also the problem. And you'll never understand what it is to rejoice in God, and you'll never understand until you see this point. That we need to be saved from our sins. So often people describe salvation in terms of Finding happiness after living in an unhappy marriage or finding a life that is more settled or finding prosperity when they were poor. That's not salvation. Your problem is not your poverty or the fact you don't have enough food to eat or even your broken life that you keep making worse. Your problem is the cause of all of those things. 
sin, sin in your life, sin that has ruled you, your slavery to sin and the evil one. And because of that, the reign of death in your life. And when you saved, you saved from that, which causes all of this disruption. And you're brought back to God, and you're no longer without God and without hope. Let me ask you, has God rejoiced over you? Has heaven rejoiced over you? Were you once lost in your sin and now are saved? Well, that's another way of asking you. Are you repentant? Does repentance characterize your life? Not just saying, Lord, I'm sorry. Everybody's sorry. I mean, have you asked God to forgive you and have you been reconciled to him through the Lord Jesus and now resolve no longer to live for yourself but for him who died and rose again? Are you on the shepherd's shoulders being carried back? Do you rest in him for a new life and a new eternity? You've seen God's joy. And God now says, rejoice with me. That's basically the message in the words of the parable. Rejoice with me. The problem with these Pharisees that didn't rejoice in what God rejoices in because they didn't know how it is, what it meant to rejoice in redemption. They didn't see Jesus as a redeemer. And I think there's the problem for many of us in the church. Number one, the reason there's not much evangelistic zeal is because actually there's no real joy in seeing a sinner converted. There are four ways you can react, says William Henriksen, to the wicked. Hatred, and when we talk about those lost in sin, the gangsters, those who are repulsive to us. There's hatred, there's indifference, there's welcome, and there's seeking. The Pharisees are characterized by the first two, hatred or indifference. God and his people are characterized by the last two, welcome and seeking. Having received the gift of eternal life, we now go out seeking. Are you a seeker? Can you say, I follow my Savior who goes out to seek and save the lost? Luke 19 verse 10. That's another way of asking, do I rejoice in what God rejoices in? That, that's the message. It's, it's not to say, well... Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm okay when I see sinners saved. I'll, I'll be happy to see one of those corrupt government officials that are ready to go to jail and now turn. Just don't ever bring him into my home. I'm happy to see prostitutes uh, delivered from such a horrible life. But I'm not going to go there. You see, I'm going to carry on living just the way I am. Well, that's just indifference. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1 verse 16 that he was not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it was the power of God unto salvation. First to the Jew and then to the Gentile. Because he was convinced that in the gospel a righteousness from God is revealed. He was like Isaiah of old. God, he could praise God because he's given him a garment of salvation, the righteousness of God. We read it, right? Isaiah 61 verse 10. And God and his people have rejoiced. As I said to you earlier on, I wonder how many commands in the Bible command us to sing. The Bible is just full. 
And it's not just in Psalms, which obviously almost every psalm nearly has a command to sing and praise God for one reason or another, either the characteristics of God, our salvation, or deliverance from trial or something. But singing is a vital part of our lives. You know, when Paul, uh, David, restores the, the tabernacle and he manages to get the ark back, he wrote a song. I'm not going to read the whole psalm, but just listen to the, the worship in that psalm. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of his salvation from day to day. 1 Chronicles 16, 23. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be held in awe above all gods. And go to Psalm 95, verse 1. It calls us to sing and worship because God has shepherded us and saved us. Psalm 149 tells us to sing a new song. See, you've got biblical warrant to learn new hymns. Okay, yes, that's not all that it teaches. Just a word on that, by the way. We are learning new hymns, and there's a reason for it. Because we are learning more and more theology. We want to find new expressions to what we see in the salvation of God. More than that, we know we change and music changes and we want to find the fullest expression of our joy. So there, I have conviction that we should learn new. That's not to despise the old. We're going to sing the old. But we sing we sing because God sings. We sing and rejoice because God our Savior and angels and the whole host of heaven do. There is joy in heaven of a one salvation, a one sinner that is saved. And we gather as those who are saved. In fact, we are a fellowship of rejoicing in our salvation and the salvation of others. That's what we are, a fellowship of rejoicing in this. That's the difference between the Pharisees. And then that leads to a zeal in evangelism. Have you heard of Molly Brown? Lifeboat 6, Titanic. Molly Brown was a very rich woman on the Titanic. And uh, if you watch the film... You will know this. They actually put her, somebody to act her part in the film. Molly Brown helped other people into the lifeboats. Being a lady, she was told to get in. Those days, they still believed women and children first. And uh, the lifeboats went down. Hers was number six. They then rowed right away from the Titanic to safety. But she noticed there was a lot of space on the boat. And the quartermaster of the Titanic was on her boat. He was obviously in command of that lifeboat. Lifeboats took about 40 people that weren't adequately filled. Molly Brown said, we have got to go back. We have got to go back. We've been saved. How can we watch them dying in the water? And the quartermaster said, no ways. We will. There's too much debris and we will be flipped over. We will land in the, the, the cold sea and die. And Molly said, no. And then Molly said, if you don't go back, I'm going to throw you overboard. So we've got a feisty lady. We don't actually know what happened after that. History doesn't tell us whether Molly got her way. But do you see the heart of Molly? She's now famous for her words. She looked at the people crying out in a cold ocean. And they were dying. And she knew... There's a time limit in the frozen waters. And she said, we have got to go back. And we've got to fill this boat. We've got to risk our lives. We've got to go. And if you don't go, I'm going to throw you overboard. That's what Molly said. Were you lost? Were you in those mountains without God and without hope? Do you know what it is to be addicted to your sin, dead in transgressions, verse 32. 
Are you looking at those who have a time limit around you? And you don't care. How is that possible? Not only do we rejoice with God, but our heart's desire is to see people not die in their sin. Ezekiel 18. God says, I do not desire the death of a sinner. Peter 1, 2 Peter 3 tells us the same thing. That's why we have this time. That's why when we're saved, we're not just snatched up to heaven. We're left to labor here and hold the word of life out to others. And then we rejoice the way Paul rejoiced in the salvation of people. In in Philippians 2, 17, he says basically what Hendrickson says, we're a fellowship of rejoicing in this. Listen to how he puts it, because it's worth reading. Philippians 2, 17, he says, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering, I'm going to risk and sacrifice, upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. So I want to ask you this morning, hatred, indifference, welcome and seeking, what describes you this morning? It's another way of me asking you if you're saved. If you're the quartermaster or Molly Brown, if you're the Pharisee here, or have the heart of the Lord Jesus beginning to pump in your heart. We start this rejoicing now. We're going to carry on all the way to heaven. Psalm 16, verse 11 says, He says this, You've shown us the path of life, and, and there's going to be, and you're going to take us to your right hand, and there's going to be joy at your right hand. The same joy will follow us all the way to heaven. And we're going to be singing this anthem in heaven as we worship the Lamb who's purchased us for God. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there's the fullness of joy. Your right hand are pleasures. At your right hand are pleasures evermore. Are we a fellowship that of this kind of rejoicing? I don't just mean singing for the sake of it. I don't mean working ourselves up, not at all. I mean rejoicing in God our Savior and rejoicing when our company is joined by one who was lost in their sins. And then when we leave this place, having found such joy, having sung and worshipped God for it, We labor to see more join the company. It's not that hard a message, is it? Heart of the Pharisee, heart of the Lord. That's what you're faced with this morning. Oh, may God give us the heart of the Lord. Let's close this section of our service with grace and ask for God's blessing on us. Let's pray. Lord, we ask you to look upon us and forgive us for our hard hearts, hard to you, hard to those around us. Forgive us for selfishness that takes away our concern for others. Forgive us for the pursuits of our lives that distract us from what's actually important. Forgive us for our sins that harden us to these realities. Please, Lord, not only forgive us, we plead, but enable us to walk in the light of the gospel, to live lives worthy of the gospel, 
and to worship you in the light of the gospel. So please part us now with your blessing. May we know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. May we know the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen.